The seventh chapter of Genesis tells of a flood event that covered the entire earth, but most secular scientists, and even many Christians, doubt that such a catastrophe could ever happen. But our planet's rocks provide ample evidence that such an event did, in fact, occur. Join ICR science staff as they travel across the American West, demonstrating the very real evidence of a global flood that occurred about 4,500 years ago. The rocks show individual layers that have been spread across vast areas of the West, many of them more extensive than the last. Today, stacks of these rocks measure thousands of feet thick, indicating a progressive flood event just like the one described in Genesis. To claim that no evidence exists for a global flood is to ignore the scientific evidence left behind. The flood left substantial signs that confirm Scripture. Truly, the evidence has been carved in stone. Welcome to Dallas, Texas, home of ICR's Discovery Center. Visitors from across the United States and beyond travel here to discover just how science affirms the authenticity of Scripture. Dr. Timothy Clary, ICR's resident geologist, has spent years researching and compiling data in an effort to provide geological evidence of a global flood. Join Dr. Clary in the flood exhibit as he discusses the time frame of Noah's flood and the results of his groundbreaking work. Tell us about this unique sphere of the earth that we have here and how it relates to your unique investigation and research when it comes to flood geology. This globe portrays the 371 day flood in about a two minute time frame. And it's based on thousands of geological data points, many oil wells and cores and columns across the various continents. And we tried to put together what we could with the Pangea-like pre-flood world and you can see in the green how we think a lot of it was green. And, and the progression of the flood is, of course, sped up to show it all within those two minutes. But it, it shows the sequence of the flood. It shows the flood really was a progressive flood. That each of the continents were slowly inundated over the course of 150 days, reaching a high point at day 150, where you see there's just total blue. And we think we can see that in the rock record across all the continents. We see the same high point or across every continent I've looked at of the flood. And so we see this, this general pattern that every continent seems to show, and we're portraying that on this particular uh, globe that we see here in the Discovery Center. So at this point, you can see the continents are coming back up out of the water. The, the flood is over in terms of its advance, and now it's receding. And so it takes another half a year or so to recede. And then, of course, by day 371, Noah and the animals were allowed to get off the ark and repopulate the earth. So in other words, it doesn't take hundreds of thousands or millions of years for these sedimentary rock units to be formed worldwide. No, we see a very rapid burial, a very rapid succession, basically a progressive flood that covers all the continents at the same time. That's the most powerful thing about my research and what we try to show here is that it really shows a universal progressive flood. All the continents do pretty much the same thing at the same time. The mega sequences record a progressive flood started with a limited flooding of the continents. As the flood progressed, it began to flood higher and higher ecological zones until reaching a high water point on day 150. This pattern explains the fossils we see beginning with marine fossils only and then land and marine mixed as the water rose higher and higher, flooding each zone. Lastly, the flood began to recede from day 150 to day 314. ICR views the mega sequences as chapters of the flood. The rock layers are like the pages and the six mega sequences are the chapters with each representing a major flooding event. Scripture says that the flood lasted over a year, and Dr. Clary's research indicates that the flood was progressive, rising to a high point on day 150 before finally receding. But what does that look like out in the real world? Dr. Clary travels to the home state gold mine in South Dakota to find out. Dr. Clary, what about this particular mine here? What significance does it have when it comes to the biblical creation model? This mine produced 41 million ounces of gold. It produced 9 million ounces of silver, but it was all disseminated in very, very low-grade ore. And that gets us back to your second question about the what's significant about this is it appears that during the insertion process of these quartz veins you see behind us, you can actually see those kind of yellow and white quartz veins. There's a lot of hydrothermal activity as well associated with it, really hot water. And the hot water transported some of the 
gold from the quartz veins into the surrounding schists and metamorphic rocks. And you can see the color even around those. There's kind of an, what we call in geology, an aureole or a zone around the quartz where a lot of that gold was actually disseminated into the rocks. There's the hydrothermal activity. Now that hydrothermal activity kind of looks back at Genesis 7:11 when you're looking at the fountains of the great deep. So perhaps this is an example of some of those fountains that were coming up. A lot of water possibly coming from as far down as the bottom of the crust or the upper mantle was being transported up through here and altering the rock called hydrothermal anamorphism. And that's what disseminated the gold so much around there. So they mined down here over 8,000 feet. Originally it was an open pit. They went and they finally went down underground, followed the quartz veins and around the quartz veins, following the schist. And then with 126 years of mining, they just shut down about 20 years ago. But it was the most productive mine so would we say that this is creation week rock? A lot of it probably is creation week rock that was altered probably during the flood, even at that metamorphic texture. And then you have possibly water similar to the fountains of the Great Deep, bringing up these gold and hot fluids coming up and disseminating that rock, you know, the gold throughout the rocks around it. So it's not just in the quartz veins, it's actually in the, the schists around the rock, around the quartz veins. The Homestake Gold Mine indicates large amounts of hydrothermal activity, which could very well be evidence of the breaking up of the fountains of the Great Deep mentioned in Genesis chapter 7. Next, Dr. Clary heads to Rattlesnake Mountain in Wyoming just 50 miles outside of Yellowstone National Park. The Great Unconformity and the Cambrian Explosion are visible at Rattlesnake Mountain, making it a two-for-one location for mysteries that conventional science just doesn't have an explanation for. The Genesis Flood, however, provides a suitable explanation for both. Signs of a global flood can be clearly seen all over the world, and we're just getting started. Dr. Caleri, what's so unique about the geologic features of this area? Well, one of the things that we can really see clearly at Rattlesnake Mountain here is the Great Unconformity. The Great Unconformity is the erosional surface that's found on every continent across the world. And our ex explanation as flood geologists is that that's part of the, where the flood actually begins, where we can see the contact between the pre-flood rocks and the flood rocks. So this is an example of the sandstone that we see on top of the Great Unconformity and an unconformity is just an erosional surface. So as these waves kind of came in, bringing in the, the flood sediments, they eroded the rocks below them. And what's eroded, eroded below are granites like this, that sometimes the evolutionary scientists say these are over a billion years old. And some of these have been metamorphosed. Some of that might've actually occurred during the beginnings of the flood. There was a lot of upheaval in the beginning of the flood, but ultimately what happened was to form the great unconformity, which again is, is a mystery to the evolutionary geologists, because it's on every continent, is you have this sandstone, part of that Sauk mega sequence, which goes sand from here in Cody, Wyoming, all the way down to Grand Canyon, all the way across to my home state of Michigan. And it pretty much covers almost the entire United States. This same sandstone just changes names from state to state. And it's right on top of an erosional surface called the Great Unconformity. So that, that's kind of the, the process that formed it was erosion and then immediate deposition as the flood waves kind of came washing in. But these are significant because they do show a lot of deformation even in the basement rocks, the crystalline basement rocks in these uplifts like Rattlesnake Mountain. And so we not only do we see flood rocks and pre-flood rocks, but some of these pre-flood rocks might have been altered and some of these magmas might have actually squirted in as part of the earliest part of the flood. So we see a lot of deformation leaving scars behind for us to witness and see the evidence of the global flood. Now you're a biologist, Dr. Sherwin. What else is significant about when you look at rocks like this? In this case, it's Cambrian. What's significant about the Cambrian explosion? Well, the Cambrian explosion, of course, is a real mystery to the evolutionary uh, naturalist, but not to, to the creation scientist. The, the Cambrian explosion is simply that, an explosion of very sophisticated and complex life forms at the very bottom, as, as you, if you will, of the Cambrian uh, sediments there. Indeed, we find the most sophisticated phyla of animals right there at the base of the Cambrian system. And as a matter of fact, 
in the late 1990s in China, paleontologists found 100% vertebrates, that is fish, found in the bottom, the base of the Cambrian, which was completely unexpected from an evolutionary viewpoint. Remember that in the Cambrian system, these Cambrian sediments, evolutionarily speaking, that's when life was supposed to first be getting starting. However, some of the most sophisticated animals, as I just mentioned, such as my favorite animal, the trilobite. The trilobite is an arthropod, which is the largest phyla in the world today. The uh, trilobite has paired jointed appendages and a chitinous exoskeleton made of chitin. And scientists have even been able to, to deduce the, the structure of the eye of the trilobite, which is one of the most sophisticated eye structures in the animal world. It's a compound eye, isn't it? A compound eye that's very uh, unique and, and characteristic of the phylum Arthropoda. And so the first time that we find life in the sedimentary rocks, it is sophisticated, it's complex. Indeed, what we say in creation science is that if it's living, it's complex. So at this site, we actually see the great unconformity coinciding with the Cambrian explosion which is what, you know, again, flood rocks are gonna bring in the first fossils. And that's exactly what we see in the Cayman Explosion. Very first fossils of, in great numbers of shelled animals, everything else, all the different phyla you mentioned. That all shows up all at once with no ancestors below. Worms, corals, jellyfish, these are all ocean bottom dwelling creatures. Mm -hmm. And therefore, these would be the first creatures to be buried in a worldwide flood. So the more that you check out the creation model, <laughs> the more it checks out. And so these are not really surprising from a creation perspective, but is a big mystery. Not only great unconformity is a mystery for evolutionists, but also the Cambrian explosion. Life, when you first find it, is very, very complex. As the former president of the Institute for Creation Research, John Morris, loves to say, everything stands or falls with the Genesis flood. Join us next time as we dig even deeper for answers. Truly, the evidence has been carved in stone.